So we'll continue on that. And uh, first, we'd like to acknowledge our guests present from uh, the public and the private sectors. We have from our national government agencies. We have Commission on Higher Education Chairperson Dr. Prospero de Vera III. Morning, sir. Dole, our Department of Labor and Employment Undersecretary Felipe Egargo Jr. Department of Education Assistant Secretary Francis Bringas. Morning. Uh, tech from the TechVoc Education and R and D Research and Development Institutions from Mindanao State University Iligan Institute of Technology Chancellor Alizedni Ditukalan. Morning. Uh, from UP Los Banos Chancellor Jose Camacho. Morning po. POST Philippine Science High School System Deputy Executive Director Rod Alan Delara. From the Government Academy Industry Network. Incorporated or GAIN Executive Director Dr. Genevieve Ledesma Laurel. From the International Rice Research Institute of the Philippines, Senior Council Attorney Eugeniano Perez. And the TUP or Technical Technological University of the Philippines, Representative Attorney Christopher Mortel. And uh, also from our other government agencies, the DTI Philippines Trade Training Center Executive Director Naili Dillera. Kiesa Legal Officer Attorney Lani Salazar, Bureau of Immigration Senior Immigration Officer Anthony Cabrera, yeah, morning to you, uh, Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry, TCCI Vice President and Semiconductor and Electronics Industries in the Philippines Foundation or SAPI Chairman Ferdinand Perry Ferrer, morning sir, uh, National Scientist Dr. Carmencita Patilla, ma'am, why are you there? <laughs> You want to come to the table, please? Uh, Dr. Ethel Agnes Pascua Valenzuela, former Southeast Asian Minister of Education or CIMEO uh, Secretariat. Where is she? Dr. Ethel Agnes Pascua Valenzuela. Not here. Okay. Uh, Dr. Alvin Culaba, Vice President and Acad Academician of the National Academy of Science and Technology. Dr. Jose Ramon Albert from Philippine Institute of Development Studies or PIDS. Attorney Antonio Eduardo Natura Jr. from Acra Law. Morning, sir. Uh, and of course, in previous, are they present? Also present are those who have uh, spoken in the previous meeting Dr. Sikat, uh, Edcom Chief Legal Officer, Attorney Estrada, PRC Director Melissa Comafe, and OIC Division Chief Rosales. Uh, Paku representative Joshua Alexander Calaguas. Uh, that's it for now. And again, we thank you for your presence, uh, your honors. So we'll, as you can see, we've got uh, several guests. So we'll turn it over to the body for uh, your feedback, which is much appreciated. We'll start with uh, more or less we'll follow the order of uh, recognition. So we'll ask uh, the Commission on Higher Education, Dr. Rivera, to give his uh, views on charter change. Morning, sir. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to uh, speak in this uh, in this hearing. Uh, I will make my presentation very short because I'm really more interested in answering questions if there are any. Uh, but uh, basically, the Commission interposes no objection to the proposal to amend the Constitution to open up control and administration of higher education institutions to foreign nationals. Uh, number one, so that we will be able to provide additional options to students who want to pursue their education in foreign universities here, help internationalize uh, higher education, facilitate university to university linkages between Philippine and foreign universities, and increase foreign student enrollment in Philippine uh, in the Philippines, but all of this will, of course, depend on the enabling law that will be passed by Congress pursuant to the constitutional amendment. The enabling law must provide incentives for foreign universities to locate here. It must uh, be able to ensure uh, complementarity between Philippine and foreign universities. 
ensure that control over the curriculum and other administrative matters remains with the Philippines, with the ministry or with CHED. But more important, we, uh, we are happy that this is being discussed because it allows us to reopen discussions on the framework for higher education, particularly on how to improve quality in higher education, how to ensure that our Philippine universities are competitive, and the kind of interventions and policies that the government must put in place to ensure access to quality higher education. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I am ready to answer any questions. Well, maybe what we do is the procedure uh Sec is we really go around the table first and then we allow questions from our colleagues. So we'll do that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Devera. Can we go to Dole, Yusek uh, uh, Philippe Egargo Jr.? Thank you very Martin much, Paul. Mr. Chair. The uh, Department of Labor and Employment expresses its support to the ongoing hearings of the Senate Committee on Constitutional Amendments in its efforts to know the pulse of the people the government bureaucracy, civil society, legal luminaries, and the entire Filipino nation in whether or not the amendments or revision to the Constitution can be executed by the insertion of the phrase unless otherwise provided by law. Section 9, Article 2, in relation to Paragraph 1, Section 3 of Article 13 of the Philippine Constitution provides that it is the policy of the state to promote full employment and equality of employment opportunities for all. In order to carry out the said objectives, the state has to work hard in inviting numerous foreign investors to invest or establish enterprises in the country that will eventually generate more jobs opportunities for the Filipinos. Hence, the proposal to amend certain restrictive economic provisions of the 1987 Philippine Constitution, particularly Articles 12, 14, and 16, will allow foreign businesses to breathe into more conducive investment landscape. It is indubitable that promotion of full employment and the equality of employment opportunities for all its is the breath of life of the department and attracting foreign investors to invest in the country is indispensable in order to fulfill the policies of the state and mandates of the department. It is therefore appropriate to support the initiative of Congress to full employment and economic development. However, we must ensure that the insertion of the praise otherwise provided by law in some restricted economic provisions of the 1987 Philippine Constitution, particularly Articles 12, 14, and 16, will not contravene the Filipino first policy enshrined also in the 1987 Philippine Constitution, as expounded by the Honorable Court in the Manila Prince Hotel versus Government Insurance System. We wish to inform the uh, committee chair and the mem honorable members of the committee that the department will submit its specific comments on the resolution. Maraming salamat po. Salamat, Yusek Gargo. Can we hear from DepEd, the ASEC bring us? To, to the Honorable Chair of this committee, Senator Angara, uh, please allow me to read the position of the department with regards to the uh, resolution number six, uh, particularly paragraph two, section four of article four of the 1987 Philippine Constitution. Uh, this is reference to the request to submit a position paper on resolution number six by both houses of Congress titled resolution of both houses of Congress proposing amendments to certain economic provisions of 1987 Constitution of the Republic of the Philippines, particularly Articles 12, 14, 
and 16, specifically the proposed amendment to paragraph 2, section 4, article 14 of the 1987 Philippine Constitution. The department is of the view that the proposed amendments by both houses of Congress to paragraph 2, section 4, Article 14 of the 1987 Philippine Constitution have far-reaching consequences and serious implications with respect to the mandate of the department and the exercise of its functions. The phrase, unless otherwise provided by law and its underlying rationale could potentially serve as a gateway to expand the scope of control and administration over educational institutions not solely by citizens of the Philippines, but by other entities as well. In this light, the scope and limits of control and administration are put into question, including the processes defining who, what, and how education shall be administered. The most basic question is, will it allow foreign entities to teach? For this, the department strongly objects to this amendment. Moreover, expanding the scope and control of administration over educational institutions to foreign entities may affect the programs and commitment of the department, specifically with respect to the implementation of the curriculum. During the foundational years of basic education, learners undergo crucial development across various areas, including physical, social, emotional, cognitive, and values. As this phase lays the foundation for future learning, it is essential that Philippine curriculum is exclusively implemented by Filipino citizens. This ensures alignment with the specific needs and context of the country. It is stressed that one of the key thrusts of the Dep Ed Matatag basic education agenda is the cultivation of learners' sense of nationality and identity as Filipinos through the Makabansa subject. Article 14, Section 3 provides that all educational institutions shall inculcate patriotism and nationalism. Having foreign entities control and administer basic education in the Philippines may run contrary to this undertaking. This begs the question, how can foreign entities who are not citizens of the Philippines and therefore may lack first-hand experience in Filipino culture and values effectively impart a sense of patriotism and nationalism to learners? Consequently, this may result in the possible dilution of the fundamental aspects of Filipino identity, culture, and values to be taught, and worse, endanger national security. In relation to national security, the removal of the third paragraph on the limits on the number of foreign nationals studying in the educational institutions and the prohibition of the establishment of educational institutions solely for foreigners, except for those created for foreign dignitaries and their dependents and for other foreign temporary residents, poses great risks on national security due to the lack of provisions for proper supervision and control over aliens in the Philippine territory. Moreover, this significantly diminishes the department's oversight of school supervision and management including but not limited to curriculum offerings, rooster of faculty, policies, programs, and matriculation. This susceptibility to external and foreign influence raises concern regarding national security as it may expose these educational institutions to infiltration and compromise. In view of the foregoing, this department strongly opposes the proposed amendment to paragraph 2, section 4, article 14 of the 1987 Philippine Constitution, specifically the vesting of full control and administration of basic education institutions to aliens through legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Sec Bringas. We'd like to acknowledge our colleague, uh, Senator Bato de la Rosa, the Senate uh, Chair of the Committee on uh, Public Order. Uh, morning, sir. Uh, I think your uh, position highlights the point or that we need more clarity in the language because the intention is not to liberalize basic education. The intent is to liberalize higher and uh, vocational and technical. So I think you can rest assured that we will not uh, open up basic education. That was touched on by several resource persons. Marami nagsabi last week na hindi nga dapat buksan. And at the outset of the educational institutions, uh, session, we already said the intention was not to uh, to open up a basic education because the importance of uh, values, uh, formation, 
uh, nationalism among others yung exactly with what you said uh, asik but my question is uh, do you have a view on higher education or are is your uh, authority to give a position limited only to basic education uh the position of the department is uh for for the um the discussions on the tertiary education uh we defer to the commission on higher education mr chair okay thank you uh can we hear from test the deputy director general rosana ordineta morning Paul. good morning mr chair the agency test the acknowledges the necessity of reframing the nation's economic policy to keep up with the demands of our increasingly globalized age while considering and protecting the Filipino first policy that guides the economic provisions of our constitutions. With the technological advancement and evolving global standards that affects employment landscape and changing workforce needs due to the fourth and fifth industrial revolution, the way we live, work, and relate to one another has been changed, thus affecting our existing systems and processes. Anchored on the National TSD Plan for 2023 to 2028, TESDA, the industry, the VET providers, and other stakeholders should come together to strengthen the TVET in the country as a source of skills, knowledge, and technolo technology needed to drive employment and productivity. The TVET sector has to keep abreast with the modern educational needs to be relevant and responsive to the workforce needs of the community, the industry, and the economy in general. TESDA supports this amendment and welcomes foreign participation and cooperation to reinforce the educational and technological needs in higher level TVET qualifications. With the national demand to align with industry requirements and standards, the breadth provision is capital intensive in terms of the state of the art equipment and facilities and foreign investments as such would provide learners and trainees better knowledge, skills and experience as in the workplace. Further, foreign trainers can impart their expertise and provide guidance that learners and trainees can adopt and learn from. In technical vocational education and training, the term highly technical refers to specialized and advanced skills and knowledge required for specific technical fields. Highly technical aspects in Tibet programs often involve in-depth training and expertise in areas such as advanced technology, mastery of cutting edge technologies relevant to particular industry, specialized techniques, proficiency in specialized techniques, methods, and procedures, industry-specific knowledge, in the understanding of industry standards, regulations, and practices, advanced machinery operation, skillful operation of advanced machinery and equipment, problem-solving skills, ability to analyze and solve complex technical problems within the context of a particular trade or profession, research and development. In some cases, highly technical TVET programs may involve aspects of research and development, pushing the boundaries of innovation in a given field. These highly technical aspects ensure that individuals completing TVET programs are equipped with specialized skills. Looking at the foreign ownership in the education sector in different countries in ASEAN, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Singapore allow 100% foreign ownership in education. The Philippines, together with Indonesia and Thailand, has a ceiling on foreign ownership. Moreover, Singapore is a regional leader in creating the regulatory framework to welcome and accommodate foreign investments. Thus, if you can see and observe, they have a highly technical Tibet sector. In Malaysia, generally 100% foreign ownership in private education is allowed, though this often depends upon the curriculum being taught. 
use of the national curriculum, whether alone or in hybrid, with foreign curriculum may limit the amount of foreign equity injection. Such uncertainty embodies one of the trickier issues for investors in Malaysia. Private education is highly regulated and lacking of clarity, although regulatory exceptions are available with approval of the Ministry of Higher Education. On the other hand, to safeguard the quality of Tibet provision, TESDA as the authority in Tibet in the country has the power and responsibility in the establishment of Tibet institutions and the regulation of Tibet provision, be it locally owned and or with foreign ownership. Through its quality assured process, the Unified Tibet Program Registration System or UTPRAS. This is an ISO system requires the mandatory registration of Tibet programs with TESTA. Please be assured, Mr. Chair, of the agency's readiness to provide its utmost support once this legislative measure is approved, according to the formalities required by the Constitution and relevant laws and issuances. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, uh, Director Urdaneta. We ask we go now to our any. We'd like to acknowledge our. Uh, Chairperson of uh, in the Senate of Basic Education and Ways and Means, Senator Win Gachalian. Morning, sir. Uh, well, any statements from our uh, uh, sen fellow senators? Planaman, we'll continue if. Yeah, Senator Bato. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ma'am Ordaneda. Yes, Mr. Senator. Mahababa yung sinabi mo eh. Po. Gusto ko lang samores. Okay ka, hindi. Okay po. Okay. Okay. For okay. highly technical uh, courses po. Okay. Thank you for uh, a very uh, short and sweet question from uh, Senator De La Rosa. Next, we'll go to our tech book education in R&D institutions. Uh, uh, and maybe we'll intersperse with the private sector para may konting uh, uh, variety and flavor. So MSU Iligan, uh, Chancellor Tito Kalan is with us. Uh, you probably flew in just for this hearing, uh, Chancellor. Uh, thank you very much. So please, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning uh, to, to our colleagues and uh, to uh, our honorable senators. Um, the Philippine government actively promotes foreign investments uh, to drive economic growth. Uh, in fact, uh, to liberalize the country's economic and encourage foreign investment, the Congress amended various laws, the Foreign Investment Act, and the Public Service Act, for instance, to allow 100% foreign ownership to selected industries. However, despite the various amendments to existing laws, they are subject to restrictive economic provisions of the 1987 Constitution. As such, there are still certain professions and industries that impose limits on foreign involvement, one of which is the limitation set under Article 14, Section 4, of the Constitution regarding educational institutions, particularly higher education and institutions. Nevertheless, despite the limitations set above, the Philippine Constitution remains dynamic to adapt to the needs of the changing times. In view of this, the proposed amendment to Section 14, Section 4, Number 2 of the Constitution becomes imperative to align with the nation's directions toward globalizations and economic liberalizations and internationalizations of higher education in particular. Internationalization is rapidly growing among higher education institutions around the world. And scholars found that HEI opt to expand and deepen their international engagement to increase revenue, enhance prestige, and improve student learning. And from a competition policy perspective, Opening each EI to foreign investment will lead to a more competitive higher education institutions. And we believe that this will benefit state universities and colleges as the government will be forced to put more funding for higher education institutions to compete with um, uh, higher education institutions controlled by foreign investment. However, as discussed by Goris of UNESCO International Institute for Higher Education, the implementations of policies on internationalizations of higher education requires 
substantial long-term investment that demands huge financial and human resources. This is seen as a challenge for HEI in the Philippines vying for internationaliz internationaliz internationalization due to constraints in organizational infrastructure and budget, among others. And we believe this constitutional amendment will address this gap. Having said that, uh, Mr. Chair, we support uh, this um, constitutional initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, next, we'll hear from you, Pilos Banyas, Chancellor Jose Camacho. Morning, Pop. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair. We support this uh, initiative. The University of the Philippines, Los Banos, has uh, uh, derived the benefits of uh, internationalization and opening up our uh, our uh, campus to best facilities and uh, expertise. UP Los Banos is currently engaged with transnational education program being initiated or funded by the Commission on Higher Education. We currently implement the dual PhD program with the University of Reading in the UK and with the Curtin University in uh, Australia. We are also uh, hosting the Nagoya University Asian Satellite Campus. Nagoya University in Japan is a producer of Nobel laureates and uh, our access it is in terms of funding of PhD a scholarship of faculty members and researchers to get their PhD degree in Nagoya while doing their administrative work in the university. Sorry, Chancellor, to interrupt, but what was the Australian University? What was the name of the Australian? Uh, that's Curtin uh, University. In How do you spell that? In Perth, uh, C U R T I N. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Right. And uh, continuing, uh, uh, furthermore, the Nagoya University, as yes, I have a uh, expound earlier uh, while being engaged with us in funding the PhD scholarship of our faculty members uh, we have access to the number of facilities and equipment that Nagoya University gives to the university uh, that Nagoya University gives to UP Los Manos every year the PhD students uh, go to uh, Japan in Nagoya uh, to conduct their research, have access to seminars and facilities being conducted or being uh, organized by their uh, Japanese uh, professors. The University of the Philippines, Los Banos, is one of the first uh, campuses of UP uh, system that has been engaged, that has engaged uh, with internationalization, especially with uh, the presence of the International Rice Research uh, Institutes. The faculty members uh, coming from IRI uh, act as uh, professors, as advisors, research professors of our PhD students. They, co al they co uh, also co-published uh, uh, the research that they have conducted with uh, the professors coming from IRI. The professors from IRI also teach in UP Los Banos. So here you can see the uh, benefits of uh, opening up our uh, borders uh, to international uh, experience when it comes to higher education. For now, I would uh, uh, describe this uh, uh, experience of the university in Thank terms you. of international. Thank you very much, Chancellor. I would like to acknowledge the presence of our minority leader in the Senate Center, Coco Pimentel, uh, who has stated he's against it. So. Please direct your favorable comments to Senator Coco. <laughs> no, but seriously, uh, I'm just curious because, uh, Chancellor Camacho, you mentioned that you already have these existing partnerships with all these uh, reputable universities. How does liberalizing the constitutional provision uh, improve on that or further it? Could, could you go into detail a little bit? For one, uh, the university should have a reputation. Uh, for these foreign universities to engage with us uh, should have a reputation. I mean, let me rephrase that. Baka hindi clear yung question ko. My question is, you're already doing it. Yes, sir. So what does, uh, when, when we, if, if we adopt this constitutional uh, provision, uh, uh, amendment, subject to a plebiscite, of course, the people have to approve it. How does that 
uh, improve further upon what you're already doing. Yeah, sir. Let me clarify that uh, our experience uh, uh, is only in terms of uh, uh, forging partnerships and uh, signing uh, uh, partnership initiatives when it comes to academic collaborations and research uh, engagements. Uh, I would say that uh, because of the reputation of the university, uh, the competencies of faculty, the expertise of the faculty, uh, the uh, quality of students that we that we recruit uh, would somehow have a bearing on uh, our uh, university partners, uh, international university uh, partners. So uh, uh, they would be interested to also engage with us, especially when uh, it comes to the kinds of uh, research, cutting edge uh, research and uh, publications uh, that our faculty and students would like to uh, engage with. Uh, Senator Wynn and then Senator Bato after. Yeah, Senator Wynn, go ahead. Just to follow up, Mr. Chairman. Um, Professor, uh, I, I heard earlier that you have partnerships already, and this is probably under the transnational uh, education law. But have you encountered any potential investors slash educa foreign education institutions uh, who... <clears throat> Uh, who um, desires ownership as a decision-making point rather than partnerships. There are limitations to both. No? There are also pros and cons to both. No? Uh, but because UP is uh, exposed to a lot of these international institutions, and I heard that you have already engaged uh, some of these international uh, institutions, but have you encountered any comments that ownership administration slash control is important and is a very important decision-making point for them in order to set up shop here in the Philippines? I would say, sir, that uh, in terms of what had, what has been expressed by uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, investors, supposedly investors or uh, higher education uh, players uh, from their home countries, this would be in terms of uh, recruiting students uh, and in terms of uh, what has been expressed is in terms of uh, the equipment and the facilities uh, that they can uh, put up in the university. Provided that uh, uh, the students and uh, faculty members uh, of the university can, can uh, be engaged in co-publication and uh, for instance, in on uh, a student and uh, faculty mobility from uh, their uh, home country. In other words, that there should be a uh, uh, an active engagement. But as regard to uh, a, a a tangible uh, investment in the in the university, that we have not encountered yet, sir. Thank you, Senator Bato. Yeah. Mr. Chair, narawin ko lang kay Chancellor Camacho. Sir, okay yung partnership ninyo, okay yung experience ninyo as far as ngayon nakikita mo, di ba? Pero titingnan natin kung ma-open up na ito. At remember, this is going to be business. Pag pumasok na sila dito, baka wala na kayong partnership, wala na kayong magiging partnership. Uh, engagement with them, they'll negotiate it. Pinapasok ninyo kami dito, amin na ito, bahala na kayo sa buhay ninyo, kami nang bahala dito. They'll, this is a negosyo. This is business. Uh, what, what do you think will happen sa, sa like sa inyo, kung masyado kayo nagre-rely sa partnership with them in order to to better your uh, your quality of education na uh, uh, inu-offer ngayon sa ating mga kababayan, Ito lang, theory ko lang ito. Kung andito na sila, tapos, well, andito na kami. Amin na ito. Uh, bahala na kayo dyan. So, siguro tayo, mag-rely tayo on our own. Uh, Goberno natin, asahan natin na pagandahin natin to or maghanap ka ng ibang uh, partnership ng ibang hindi nakakapasok dito. Eh, ako lang, nag-iisip lang ako lang ko na ng possibility na. What do you think, sir? 
at uh, tingin ko sir ay uh, uh, papasok po mas mas makahikayat po, po tayo ng uh, uh, mas uh, maraming uh, quality higher education uh, investors to mga uh, foreign investors on uh, academic institutions and higher education. Uh, sa tingin ko sir kung uh, babaguhin po or may improve po natin natin mga sistema at uh, mga proseso. Uh, sa tingin ko sir uh, mas makakahikayat tayo dito kung ang mga uh, proseso sa procurement o mga proseso sa regulations natin ay uh, ma-harness or ma-improve po natin. Pero, sir, halimbawa po, uh, yun po sa Nagoya University, every time po na sila po ay uh, magdo-donate ng mga equipment or facilities nila dito sa, sa amin, sa UPLB, kailangan pong dumaan sa costumes. Uh, pero dahil po mabusisi yung proseso ng pagpasok uh, ng mga highly yung mga matata, yung mga, mga uh, high-tech na equipment po, ay kailangan po talaga nilang pagdaanan ng mga gayong uh, proseso. So, kailangan po siguro na mas uh, mapadaliho natin yung mga proseso para mas makahikayat pa po tayo ng mga uh, foreign investors on higher education. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, yung concern lang ako sa atin, yung sarili natin, but just in case makapasok sila dito, what will happen to ours, yung atin talaga din, siguro, uh, magbibinipid tayo dyan in the sense na kung ano yung magiging produkto nila, baka pwede nating ipapasok sa ating sistema, then that will contribute, di ba? Assimilation or how do you call it? So, yun lang nakikita ko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Salamat, Sir. That's a good point, by, uh, Senator uh, De La Rosa. Yung baka nga, <laughs> mawala yung partnership ko sa kali. I'm just curious, Chancellor, ito bang tatlong nabanggit yung universidad? Yung Nagoya, uh, Curtin, at saka Reading. Are they private or state-owned uh, uh, Ang Nagoya po, sir, ay uh, uh, public. Uh, public po yun. And then oh. ang uh, Reading din po ay uh, public. Okay. Ang uh, Curtin, sa pagkakalam ko din po, sir, ay uh, uh, public din po. Ah, so they're all three are public? Yes, sir. Okay. So... Yung concern ni Senator Bato will apply to a privately owned, kasi yun, profit uh, um, uh, run, uh, they're determined, their their policies will be determined by their profit motive. Pero it's a good point, uh, Vice Chair. Thank you. Uh, siguro, let's, let's switch over to, uh, let's have one more from the Research and Development Cluster. Uh, si Director Delara of the OST Philippine High School, Science High School. And then we can go to the uh, some of our private sector uh, uh, resource persons, PCCI and uh, uh, Dr. Kulaba, Tony Natura, among others. Um, so, can we hear from uh, the DOST Philippine High Philippine Science High School System Deputy Executive Director Rod Delara? Is he here? Yes. Ah, yes, sir. Morning. Morning, Mr. Chair. With reference to the Senate resolution of both houses, number six, titled a resolution of both House of Congress proposing amendments to certain economic provisions of the 987 Constitution of the Republic of the Philippines, particularly articles number 12, 14, and 16, the PSHS system posed no objection at this point to the aforesaid constitutional amendment that will allow the entrance of foreign schools in the country to offer basic and or higher education services to Filipino and non-Filipinos residing or living in the Philippines. The PSHS system being the country's premier STEM high school, catering to Filipino scholars with high aptitude in science and mathematics, welcomes all government initiatives that will improve the standards of education in the country at all levels. Foreign or international schools operating in the Philippines have been part of our feeder system, time immemorial. During the 2023 PSHS National Competitive Examination, or the NCE, some 224 students from 62 locally-based international schools sat for the NCE to vie for 1,920 available scholarship slots 
across the country, of which 95 of them scored above the national mean score, the minimum NCE score required to be considered as principal qualifier in a PSHS campus. For a better perspective, only 3,510 students out of 24,738 NCE applicants across the country scored above the national mean score. For international schools, this translates to a 47% qualifying rate, which is significantly higher than the national average of 14%. As for the entrance of international universities in the country, this would provide additional pathway for our graduates. In 2021, some 138 PSHS scholars qualified for admission to 258 undergraduate courses from 90 universities abroad, but only a little over 20% of them would pursue studies abroad due to high cost of living and studying abroad. Having international universities in the Philippines can offer alternative pathways for our scholars to earn international degrees at substantially lower cost. In view of the above, the PSHS system is receptive to the Joint House Resolution proposing to amend the Constitution that will allow the entrance of foreign schools and universities in the country and reserves its comments until the ensuing law and implementing rules and regulations thereto is drafted. Thank you. Just to clarify, you're saying you're well, you were uh, uh, in favor of uh, entry into basic education at the high school level, secondary level? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, can, can I just want to recap your stats? You're saying 14% versus for, for uh, 47% versus 47 47%. versus 14%. Okay, but that's a that's a that's a statement on our basic education, really, diba? You're saying it's it's of a lesser quality when it comes to uh, what's that science and uh, what what other mathematics? Some of the mathematics, STEM, 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 STEM in general. STEM. Okay, okay, sige. Thank you. Uh, uh, as said, as mentioned earlier, uh, with the permission of my colleagues, we'll move to some of the private sector just to. Uh, have a different flavor. The PCCI is here. So we have the vice president of the SATI or the Semiconductor and Electronics Industries in the Philippines, Chairman Ferdinand Terry Ferrer. Of course, uh, semiconductors are our main export, if I'm not mistaken. No? So please correct me, the DTI people, if I'm not familiar. Uh, so, Perry Ferrer, uh, sir, please. Uh, yes, good, uh, good morning, uh, uh, Honorable Chairman and also to the senators. Uh, thank you for giving the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry an opportunity to speak here, as well as SAPI, the Semiconductor Electronics Industries to the Philippines, which is the largest exporter. In 2023, we exported around 46 billion uh, exports. Uh, the Philippine Chamber of Commerce will support any constitutional amendments, but limited only to the economic provisions that will enhance the competitiveness of the Philippines and attract more local and foreign investors. And enhancing the ability of our country to participate in more effective, effectively in global trade. That is where PCCI will always be your supporter and also be your partner. Uh, when it comes to education, it's always been our advocacy to generate quality jobs. But quality jobs, but quality jobs needs quality workers, quality and capable workers, which all stem from the educational system. We have 3.4 million students. We graduate approximately 750,000 annually. This is the feeder stock or the feeder institution to continue the successful uh, on our businesses. Without these students, without quality education, without 21st century skills in our educational system, in our graduates, our 
businesses will continue to incur more cost in their own training. So we we support any measures that if we can bring in international uh, partners into the country in providing 21st century skills into the country, into our 3.4 million students, this will ensure the continued trajectory of our businesses and growth in our businesses. So uh, when it comes to supporting international uh, partners, I believe uh, earlier it was mentioned, we believe international institutions, educational institutions will not just dive in and come in 100%. We believe, uh, like any other business, they will look for local partners. We have several uh, private and SUCs, and I believe the foreign educational institutions will initially look for partners in the Philippines. From then, there will be technology or educational transfer, which in turn will flow down to our students and eventually businesses. Thank you, Chairman. Well, it's quite an, an enlightened uh, viewpoint from your point of view because some domestic uh, industries would not want the competition. But uh, so we, we thank you for that. Uh, but but with respect to your specific industry, and maybe perhaps you put on your hat as a uh, as a participant in the semiconductors, how how would uh, liberalizing higher education improve? Aside from providing quality graduates, uh, that assumes the entry of quality institutions also into our country. But uh, aside from that, what specifically, uh, what niche would the Philippines uh, be able to, or how uh, uh, climb yung ladder, so to speak? No, uh, I just mentioned that because the Senate made an amendment in the DTI budget to uh, study the possibility of wafer manufacturing. I think we discussed that uh, when when we spoke at the PCCI at some point. No? So that that's uh, under the Senate amended uh, the DTI budget to include a study on wafer manufacturing because we realize if we don't have the industries here, then the graduates will just leave. But maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, uh, where you want the industry to go if you had uh, uh, the ability to attract uh, uh, quality institutions and to produce quality graduates, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, I will limit my discussion on education and training. Our semiconductor industry, uh, we all know that a lot of uh, investment has gone to our neighboring countries. Uh, and thank you for discussing the possibility of having a wafer fabrication uh, here in the Philippines, which is the missing element in the whole semiconductor supply chain. We have the design and development. We have assembly, test, and packaging. Only thing missing is the wafer fab. And that is, you can say that is the soul when it comes to semiconductors. Vietnam is investing heavily on wafer fab. India is now investing in wafer fab. And that's how it all starts in the wafer fabrication. Of course, prior to that is the design and development. But uh, we all know about TSMC, whereas TSMC now has two factories, uh, inaugurated one factory in, in Japan, in Kyushu, uh, now starting a second factory. TSMC now has a factory in Arizona. So, the reason I'm specifically talking about the semiconductor and electronics, it provides high quality, high paying jobs in the Philippines. At the same time, it creates downstream the supply chain. Now, uh, liberalizing, uh, bringing in uh, international training or educational uh, institutions in the Philippines, we have a gold mine in the Philippines, which is 3.4 million students, which is the envy of most countries, which they don't have that young population. So educating, not just educating, uh, developing, upskilling our students to the 21st, 22nd century skills, what the industry needs will secure the Philippines 
will secure the Philippines uh, chairman in his position to be a first world economy by 2050. That one we believe in the industry. We truly believe, but we need to upskill our workers and uh, our students, which we have now, 3.4 million. So uh, bringing in partners now, uh, there is always the discussion of jobs and skills mismatch. Actually, we just want to narrow it down. We don't want it to meet because the gap between the the skills mismatch in the job that's the innovation part we want the industries to continue to innovate and let the educational system you know just be not far behind but during the pandemic what we saw in the industry our the quality of our graduates deteriorated it's because of the digital divide you know, uh, here in Manila, you know, the, our, our the students was able to go online, go on online training, education. But what was alarming was the provincia, who was not able to go online or learn. So there are many things to improving, but one is really connectivity. And I, I, I know uh, there are programs, the open access bills, uh, improving the connectivity, inter con internet connectivity throughout uh, DepEd and the higher education. And that's one step of bringing our uh, students, our future leaders and business people to uh, higher uh, skilled and higher skilled workers. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that. From uh, the National Academy of Science and Technology, we have Dr. President, Vice President and Academician of the National Academy of Science and Technology, Dr. Albert. Alvin sorry, Dr. Kulapa. I'm sorry. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Chair and the Honorable uh, Senators. Uh, please allow me to share my screen here uh, for my uh, position. Uh, I would like to make it clear that uh, I've been invited here as a resource person. And my views does not necessarily shared by the National Academy of Science and Technology and of uh, De La Salle University. But uh, I'm an engineer and I have over 30 years of, uh, you know, uh, experience within the scientific and the academic uh, community. No, so the, just uh, uh, as an introduction, which uh, uh, area of research? Mechanical is your area energy, of research? energy. Energy. energy research. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, amending the Article 14, Section 4 uh, uh, of the 1987 Constitution, uh, will this necessarily create wealth, you know, for, for the country? Next slide, please. I'm taking off from the, the last uh, public hearing where many of my colleagues uh, actually shared their views uh, on this uh, proposed amendment. If you look at this uh, particular uh, slide here, these are the stages of development and the competitiveness uh, drivers. Uh, there are three, uh, you know, in the uh, world uh, global competitiveness uh, ranking, they look at basic efficiency and innovation. But uh, the Philippines is still situated in the transition between the factor-driven stage and the efficiency-driven stage. We are very far from the innovation-driven stage, where, in fact, in this current administration, we would like to pursue an industrial strategy which is driven by innovation. Next slide, please. In this particular slide shows the GII, the Global Innovation Index. This has been shown by some of my colleagues uh, last uh, public hearing. And I just want to reiterate, uh, you know, in the 2023 uh, data that the Philippines still, you know, far from even amongst the, the ASEAN from the point of view of uh, research and development score and in terms of the researchers in full-time equivalent per million population, which is actually reported as 173.6. Okay. 
So we're a bit uh, far uh, from our uh, neighbors here in, in the ASEAN. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. If we want to move up the value ladder to the innova uh, innovation stage, it is a lot of uh, you know, work now from a physical resource-based uh, economy to labor-intensive, moving up to the capital-intensive economy and to the knowledge-based and technology-based economy and, and up in the lower, ladder is the innovation uh, st uh, stage. So where is the Philippines here? We're still uh, hovering between a labor-intensive to a capital-intensive uh, 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 you know, uh, transition uh, economy. Next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Kulawa, kasi yes. I'm sure maraming nanonood sa hearing natin yeah. ngayon. I think those are very technical terms, no? Maybe if we could take a pause and uh, explain lang natin sa masa. Paano tayo nag, ano yung ibig sabihin ng labor intensive? Ano yung, at ano yung mga ehemplo niyan, yung capital intensive? Ano yung, for example, what is a labor intensive uh, uh, product or innovation? And when, when do you know, uh, kailan mo malalaman na nandun ka na sa capital intensive? Okay. Oh, please, sorry. But most of our, I don't know, uh, Karamihan ng industriya natin dito sa Pilipinas ay micro and small and medium enterprises. And therefore, uh, the technology that uh, are actually uh, utilized are still manual uh, and therefore would uh, use more people, uh, you know, to operate these uh, machines. And uh, yes, I think the DTI is here about what so things like garments, siguro mga garments, garments mga so yeah, factories oh, that yeah, we doesn't have, involve uh, uh, technology too much, no? Yeah, but if, even in higher, like even in semicon, yeah, there is still a lot of uh, engineers needed there, uh, you know, to operate, uh, you know, the machines. In terms of capital intensive, uh, you know, uh, business or you know, these are, you know, the manufacturing uh, industry, uh, like in semicon, for example, no. Um, the the uh, other industries uh, you know that uh, really make use of of huge machines and uh, high tech machines so these are capital uh, intensive uh, okay um, uh, activities okay next slide please so the government has been uh, spending a lot you know in building science technology and uh, you know engineers and this is a an important investment. It is a business investment as we see that science is uh, a business for the people. Hence, there must be a return on investment. And uh, the return on investment here should uh, actually transform to uh, economic growth and national competitiveness. Next slide, please. So our national investment in SD has been on capacity building. Huge and massive funds are put into, you know, building our s and capacity through scholarships. For many, I'm, I, I'm a, uh, you know, a recipient of that. And of course, uh, also building our readiness uh, to do research and innovate. And uh, this is the core of our uh, STE uh, investment, you know, in this country. But did this investment translated into the growth in our economy and competitiveness of our country. Next slide, please. Currently, the Philippine Science and Technology Human Capital has to be mobilized to the various strategies and roadmaps that our agencies of the government, like the Department of Science Technology, the Commission on Higher Education, the Department of Trade and Industry. But we are also guided by the Philippine Development Plan. 23, 2023 and 2028, there are some economic agenda there, which also includes science, technology, and innovation. And the National Academy of Science and Technology, actually through the DOST, the Pagdanao 2050, which Academician uh, Padolina mentioned in the last public hearing. Uh, next slide, please. So the s and Human Capital Development Framework would see that the academe is at the core of our human capital uh, source. And it actually connects to, to the practically all sectors of the economy. It has, it's actually uh, the main uh, you know, producer of our s and human capital. 
So we need to strengthen our academic, uh, you know, institution, as it can be seen in this uh, uh, diagram. Uh, next slide, please. The current state of our education, based on the CHED 2023 data, there are over 2,000 uh, higher education institutions, which actually includes the various satellite campuses of SUCs. If we exclude these satellite campuses, it would still be around 1,975 higher education institutions. And uh, to think that there are only how many of the uh, institutions here have centers of excellence, as you can see on the upper uh, third quadrant of this uh, slide, centers of excellence and centers of development, mostly concentrated in the national capital region. And there are not many, uh, you know, uh, science programs or STEM programs which are actually considered as centers of development or centers of uh, excellence. The data also shows that there are in the academic year 2016 to 2017, according to the CHED data, only a few or 28 out of this, you know, HEIs that we have offer PhD programs. It is understandable because the CHED requires that to be able to offer a PhD program, you need three full-time faculty in that particular area, in general area. You are not even talking about very specific area in the, in the discipline. So the SNT situation in our HEIs is a bit alarming because if you look at the data on the lower end of this figure, the... Uh, in STEM enrollment is going down. Now, if we want to address our innovation-driven uh, economy in the future, well, we have to rethink. How do we reverse this, this trend, okay? STEM graduates also are declining. So we need to uh, really, uh, you know, uh, look at that. And that particular figure there shows the different, you know, STEM areas. Okay, next slide, please. So this is the current scenario. I'm analyzing uh, currently, uh, you know, assessing the S&T human capital in the country. So at the moment, this is how it's, it's happening. The industry cannot move up uh, primarily because of the weaknesses of our s &T sector from our uh, academic, you know, institutions. There are not many faculty with PhDs. Why are we talking here of PhDs? No? Because these are the people who are actually expected to generate new knowledge. Universities, by definition, you know, should generate new knowledge, apart, of course, from the uh, other uh, functions of teaching and the extension or community uh, service. In fact, in our uh, assessment, Many of those who conduct research and development, about 42% have no PhDs. So what do you expect? Of the, the, the quality of ideas, uh, you know, that will come out of those research, you know, activities. So if you can see this diagram, while the government provides the uh, regulations and, the, uh, you know, incentives and other programs, scholarships, etc., to be able to support, you know, the, the graduate, the STEM graduates, so that it can supply the needed, uh, you know, manpower of industry, as uh, Mr. Ferreira mentioned, you know, earlier. There's still a lot of things to be done in the HEI. Our capacity at the HEI is not there. That's why it's tilted. There's a gap. That's the problem. Next slide, please. In our uh, S&T human capital, we, the government has identified seven priority areas from water, food, and nutrition, health, sufficiency, clean energy, environment, infrastructure, and even technology. There are not many of our S&T uh, you know, personnel are competent enough you know, to, to actually contribute towards solving the problem of this, uh, you know, uh, particular, you know, sectors. Uh, next slide, please. 
So what do we need to do? I think it's a good idea to open up foreign HEIs in the country. This is what I probably call as a catch-up strategy. If we do the business as usual at the moment, our capacity to train our own uh, PhDs in this country is very, very low. We will not be able to do it. We will not be able to catch up with, you know, our population is growing at a fa much faster rate than at the rate we are actually producing our SNT, uh, you know, human capital. So in other words, uh, you know, so the, the foreign HEIs will actually accelerate the opportunity to, uh, to train and capacitate our uh, uh, SNT uh, human resource. And if that happens, you can see that, you know, it will be now more balanced, uh, you know, so we can put the industry up and hopefully, you know, uh, deliver, uh, you know, the, the wealth that is needed by, by this country. With your permission, uh, yes, Dr. Pulaba, who are, who are the producers of the PhDs? Is it the state colleges or is it the private institutions? Both. Right now. Well, so when we say we are lagging behind, both the private and the public are lagging behind. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's a mandate of, you know, a higher education is a, a, a trifocal function. So research is already, you know, what, of course, our core, core function is to teach. So if we need to strengthen our industry, then, and uh, sustain innovation, we need to have highly capable uh, s &T people. So, uh, uh, you know, because the, the objective there is to develop technology. We cannot just make a user of technology. We have to develop technology. And the development of technology and innovation arise from a strong research and development activities. But certainly there are many challenges uh, to this, which I have actually indicated in this, chat, in this, you know. But on the right side, if you look at the, uh, the other post, no? There is this red, uh, you know, uh, space there, which are actually the challenges that we need to address. I think it was actually mentioned already many times by our colleagues and resource persons today and the last public hearing. There are still uh, many restrictions if we, uh, if a foreign institution would be would be operating in the country, and that has to be addressed as well. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is hopefully, uh, you know, what will come out, an innovation ecosystem. Uh, you know, an innovation ecosystem is actually uh, a diverse, uh, you know, uh, participants uh, from all, you know, sectors of, of the economy. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, hopefully with uh, a robust innovation ecosystem, we can now translate our investment in science, technology, and engineering to, uh, you know, uh, economic growth and national uh, competitiveness. And next slide. Currently, what's happening is many of our talents are going out. And do you want to continue this? Okay, so we have to take care and uh, capitalize on the on the talents that we have uh, you know uh, in the country next slide please and uh, next slide please and finally amending the constitution on article 4 personally it's necessary to create wealth my answer is yes thank you i noticed that slide has the biggest font in your pinaka important thank you uh, dr kulaba uh, can we hear from, uh, since you brought up that whole academe thing, maybe we should also consult the people at UP and TUP, so Technological University of the Philippines, uh, Attorney Christopher Mortel. Uh, Attorney, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Uh, Presiding Chairman and the Honorable Members of the Committee, uh, fellow workers in the government, good morning. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time, and it's, it has already been uh, discussed by several uh, resource persons, the Technological University of the Philippines uh, joined the position of the Commissioner on Higher Education in supporting the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But maybe you could share a little bit. Uh, what, what is the status now of TUP? Ano bang 
what is your mandate when it comes to higher education and innovation uh, and how are you performing it or and uh, uh, how will uh, uh, opening up the education uh, to foreign owned institutions improve our innovation ecosystem of course nabanggit na rin ng iba no but but from your standpoint sir uh, from the university standpoint and to uh, bring context the Basically, the mandate of the university is to provide education, particularly in engineering and technology education. And bringing in a uh, uh, foreign institution or liberalizing the uh, uh, higher education institution in the Philippines will also support in the effort of the uh, government to, or in support of the internationalization effort of the university as well as uh with regard to upskilling the uh faculty of the university mr chair okay uh up can we hear from dr menchit padilla ma'am good morning to um Mr. Chair and the members of the committee, I actually am here to represent uh, researchers and scientists. But allow me to just uh, say at the offset that uh, at the outset that any amendment that will help help research and development growth in the country is going to be welcome. But let me make this a couple of points. Well, number one, um, in the issue of um, um, internationalization there are many ways uh, partnership is part of the life of up so i'm actually uh, a retired professor of the university and partnerships we have survived just on the area of partnerships in the field of medicine even before even without for with formal informal engagements we have collaborated with um universities in the us europe asia and without any of these universities wanting to have any investment in our university. But they want to partner in terms of production of new ideas. So maybe I will just limit it to the field of health. So if I may just bring in home a point that uh, um, there is another way of solving the issues at hand. Number one, in UP Manila, we have actually been able to push the issue of uh, new knowledge and productivity. But let me explain to you now that even if we were able to produce a lot of products, there is a gap in our system because we are not able to scale up our products and our researchers will have to bring it overseas and then bring it, bring it back to the Philippines at a higher cost. So if you're looking now at investment and business to the country, we actually have another formula. So maybe I'd like to share this now that, you know, as a... Um, as a research university, we are expected to produce the products for the country to solve the problems. And we have identified another solution. So we have the products now. We'd like to set up a science and technology park to actually scale up our products that we have developed in the country. So that will bring in foreign investment because they will be locators who, we, who, who can actually bring in talent and expertise to help our students and at the same time keep them. So maybe I, I'll wear another hat at this point. I, I actually chair a committee that is setting up the science and technology, technology park for UP Manila at the new Clark City. What we realized during the COVID pandemic is that even if we produced a lot of products, there was no uh, nothing in the country that can scale them up. And when we ran out of... Um, of uh, you know the parts, nobody would give them to the Philippines because they had their own problems. So with a very tight schedule at the moment, uh, UP Manila is setting up a science and technology park specifically for health so that we can uh, scale up at least 26 local products that we have on hand. And we have 13 biomedical devices that we can produce for our country. So that actually brings in um, uh, low cost, uh, products and the biomedical devices for use of the health sector. Now, um, where does the government come in? Okay, Because now we're working very hard. We're, well, we've been supported by the Department of Science and Technology for products for TRL. TRL is a technology readiness level from one to four. 
we are working with the DTI at the moment to help us scale, us, scale this up. And now we're working with government like Department of Health to buy to the product. So if we talk about what will bring the business to the country, it's not just foreign investment to the university, but actually helping the university produce the products and then scale them up. Now, I the ladder presented by academician uh, uh, Kulaba shows the labor intensive the and, and the innovation on the top of the ladder. You want to go up the ladder. So what I'm saying now is that the universities are actually producing innovations. But to be able to do that, we need support from government. We need foreign investment. So right now, as we build the science and technology park in New Clark City for the health sector, we are talking to foreign investors and local investors. It will bring in jobs. It will bring in the talent who can help in the universities. So in the spirit of internationalization, I just want to share the uh, with UP, of course, with Chancellor Camacho, that partnerships is one way of internationalization. But the liberalization that we are appealing for is to allow us to hire foreign faculty. Because in the current, in our current state right now, we are not allowed to hire foreign faculty. They can only be lecturers. I think that can improve the, um, if we can do that, then I think we can bring more people here. So liberalization means not only bringing in investment to the university, but actually bringing in the talent and hiring them formally. This has been done by many countries in the region. And I know for a fact that um, many countries like Singapore, they brought in talent from abroad to be able to scale up uh, their capacity with an exit strategy of at least a decade. So in the spirit of um, investment, we urge the government to fund our local researchers. Um, the investment comes in many ways. Education is one, but to become a research university, you must be producing the products. So that will mean investment from government. If you want to scale up now for, for the products, then we appeal to government to support the science and technology park so that we create jobs in the Philippines, bring foreign talent, and at the same time, bring business. So at the moment, uh, in the development of the science and technology... With your permission, uh, yes. I think you raised a very important point, the uh, hiring of foreign personnel, because that's a different provision of the Constitution. And in that provision, there is already a uh, proviso or an exception, uh, meaning, I'll, if I may read, this is uh, Article 12, Section 14, the second paragraph. The practice of all professions in the Philippines shall be limited to Filipino citizens, save in cases provided by law. So I think mas swak yun dun sa provision na ito kaysa dun sa pinag-uusapan uh, sa resolution number 6. Tama ba yun, Dr. Padilla? Is that what's preventing you from... Uh, because there is no enabling law? Uh, yes, because in, in UP, I'll just speak for you. Well, we'll consult okay. uh, Attorney Natura and the other lawyers, Attorney Estrada, uh, Dr. Devera also on this. But but please, go ahead if you have we to. We can only hire them yeah. as uh, lecturers. We cannot hire them as professors. So if you want to get talent from another university... They and, do not and what is the difference? Could you just specify for those who are not... Uh, knowledgeable about the world of academe what is the yeah if you wanted to hire a professor then you bring them to come in with all the uh, the perks of the position they become a regular faculty member of the university and with so, research with respect to research what is the difference uh well we do have research professors now in the university it's really the same that's just one one uh, one position at the moment they can be hired as uh, lecturers that's one uh, they can be not at the level, because if we're talking about tertiary education of hiring additional talent, that will be the entry point wherein we will be allowed to hire a foreign faculty as part of our regular faculty. Uh, for the science and technology part, I don't think that will be an issue because the goal is to bring in uh, foreign talent uh, really from uh, local and international already at the moment but for tertiary education we will need a uh, the guidelines for that to allow us to hire them as regular faculty uh yeah okay thank you I'll, I'll i'll still give you time afterwards but i just want to 
to this point, uh, Dr. Rivera, yes, you're raising your hand. And then I'll ask the two lawyers here. Yeah, a quick intervention, Mr. Chair. I'd like to inform the committee that even if you uh, teach in a state university or college, dual citizenship is not allowed. The civil service requires that you have to give up your citizenship to be able to, to uh, teach in... Uh, and be appointed in a state university or college. I, it's really interesting because we encourage them to come back here, but we don't allow them to that's teach. A, that's a very interesting, yeah. uh, no, no. Maybe, <laughs> I think we should consult the Civil Service uh, Commission on that policy. Is that a, a, it's a long-standing policy, uh, Dr. A uh, 2016 uh, circular mm -hmm. by the Memorandum Circular of the Civil Service Commission, right. MC number right. 23, series of 2016. Yeah. So yeah, I understand the spirit of this law, no? but maybe medyo baka maiwan tayo dito sa ganitong klaseng uh, pag-iisip. No? So like, can I get the thoughts of... Uh... You yes, know, sir. You know, Mrs. Chairman, what, what is the spirit? Kasi Filipino din yun. <laughs> yun nga. So I think the spirit, the spirit is to ensure allegiance only to one country. So, But that's that kind of thinking, I think, is product of a, a more uh, uh, outdated world or, or a different world. Uh, maybe not to prejudge it, but mm. oh, it's the product of a different world. Uh, a world where you know nationality was very important and maybe we fought wars uh, uh by firing guns and uh, which is still being done in ukraine and other things but but of course the world has changed in many respects uh, mr president and uh, um there is a much benefit to be taken from uh, migration for instance as shown by you know when einstein migrated to the us among other things and you know there was a lot of uh, knowledge sharing there uh, just just to give an example no so Yes, yes, go ahead. Go ahead Senator. Just to emphasize that uh, a Filipino who is a dual citizen is, from the point of view of Philippine law, a full Filipino. Tandaan natin yun, talaga full Filipino. I think yun ang uh, sinasabi nga ni Dr. Vera. <laughs> Bakit natin pinayagang maging Filipino? And yet, parang hindi natin binigay ng buo sa kanya, di ba? Binigay natin sa kanya, pero for what? Di ba? For maybe maybe so he can own land, he can do other things. But but di na natin binuo na it, it works to our detriment pa, di ba? You know, I think that's Tapos, his point. Tapos meron pa tayong, ba? meron pa tayong palik scientist program na most likely, kunyari, naka 10 to 20 years na sa ibang bansa yun, baka dual citizen na bumalik siya rito. Tapos ano, hindi siya pwede magturo. That's yeah, it. Very good uh, example. Uh, in fact, in fact, uh, yes, I'll, I'll recognize Senator De La Rosa you, after you, Senator Pinedo. Siya pwede magturo. Yeah. He cannot be appointed to a plantilla position in oh, state. He will be required to give up his other citizenship. That's yeah. the rule of the Civil Service Commission. Uh, hindi naman kasal yan, eh, di ba? Parang, <laughs> hindi, naman pwedeng, hindi naman pwedeng dapat isa lang, di ba? I think in the world of academia, are we in agreement that, uh, in fact, these multiple connections or engagements are beneficial rather than detrimental? Tama ho ba? Ayun. So, so that's established, no? So then we'll ask... Uh, uh, attorney Natura and Attorney Estrada on their views on this. Uh, and and but, but, yeah, that, that uh, mas, ma, maganda mo na nabanggit yan because these are the implementing laws of our constitutional provisions that can actually defeat the intent or maybe improve the intent of the Constitution as the case may be. Attorney Natura, yes. Uh, good morning. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning, uh, Honorable Senators. Uh, again, uh, thank you for uh, the invitation to uh, give my personal insights on on uh, the proceedings now no? on specifically on the uh, matter at hand on the revision of a uh, paragraph uh, 2 of section 4 of our article 14 no? okay um again i have to make a disclaimer i'm appearing here as a you know uh, just to give my personal insights I'm, I'm not appearing here on on behalf of the firm okay um okay um just to make it quick uh you know uh we I saw that based on the resolution of both houses, the the proposed proposed revision of a uh, of uh, section four, um, the insertion of the word basic uh, in educational institutions. I understand from the honourable chair that uh, the intention really is to limit. Uh, it, intention is not to open uh, uh, basic educational institutions to foreign ownership. No? So, uh, in which case, the 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 flip side of it, I think, is the I mean. The intention is really to open up the higher educational institutions to foreign ownership. Uh, so, with that, um, I, I, I guess there is just need a need to clarify also uh, what would be the scope of uh, the uh, residual power of Congress in the second sentence in in uh, in requiring the increase of Filipino equity ownership. Because as as of this point, at least from the draft, 
the uh, power is uh, still to be exercised in uh, on all educational institutions. Same with the third provision. Same with the third sentence, where the uh, uh, phrase "unless otherwise provided by law" was inserted. Um, again, um, there may also be a need just to clarify the scope of the power of Congress in uh, ensuring uh, at what or to what particular institutions or educational institutions that control and administration should be reserved to uh, Filipino citizens. Okay. Um, uh, I guess uh, this is this is this is also a good opportunity to also consider the other uh, related provisions in the constitution that may have an effect that may be affected by the revision of uh, uh, the amendment of uh, uh, section four. Um, um, in particular, uh, I we we note that uh, at least from the text of the resolution. Um, the uh, third paragraph of the original uh, section four was no longer included, insofar as um, um, the limitation on the uh, alien students. So, um, uh, if if uh, the intention really is to, uh, if if again we must also clarify whether the intention really is to remove the entirety of the provision or to retain it and with certain modifications also that may be consistent already with the proposals. Um, another uh, uh, other provisions that may also need to be examined will be uh, Section 3 uh, of the same article, insofar as the uh, requirement of the Constitution to teach uh, the, con the Philippine Constitution in, by, uh, in all, uh, all educational institutions, as well as the Paragraph 2, which uh, uh, Im imposes the duty on uh, these educational institutions. To, uh, to, uh, to instill patriotism, the value of uh, nationalism, foster love. So uh, those, I think, may also need to be uh, examined as and when uh, um, um, the uh, provisions are, are being implemented, are, are, to be, you know, are to be further discussed. And um, in relation to that, uh, since this is also a duty being imposed on the, uh, at, at least for uh, paragraph 2, section 3, is also a duty being imposed on uh, educational institutions. Uh, I think there's uh, at least there is also a need to consider also what is the uh, uh, constitutionally recognized academic freedom of higher educational institutions on, on, on the possibility of Congress or the law implementing or imposing duties on these educational institutions on what can be covered or what should be in, in included uh, as part of their duties. Okay. Um, having said uh, uh, those points, um, uh, based on what I've heard uh, this morning, as well as what from what I've read, uh, based on the discussions uh, during the first hearing, I do believe that uh, again um, this uh, is an opportune time to get a you know to, to get a to to find the right balance to find the right balance on. Um, you know, uh, trying to uh, ensure that the Filipino interests and the Filipino values are 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 are, are um, instilled continuously to be instilled in the uh, in uh, our students, and of course to achieve what I see as the uh, laudable objective of uh, trying to uh, open up uh, educational institutions, which as in the whereas clause of the resolution is to uh, uh, give uh, uh, access the best educational institutions of both foreign and uh, Filipino students. Thank you, Attorney Thank you. Before I go to Attorney Estrada, I, I apologize to Senator Bato because I, I promised to recognize him earlier. He was going to make a point. I hope you did not lose your train of thought, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just want to comment on what Chairman Popo Dibera said earlier. The dual citizens that cannot, uh, cannot, uh, cannot uh, practice their profession here in the Philippines. Para rin yang si Justin Brownlee ba? Binigyan natin ng ginawa natin naturalized citizen. Tapos, hindi pa rin makapaglaro sa PPA as a, as a Filipino. But as an import. Parang ganun pa rin yun. Mga, mga, ano, mga kwan sa batas ba? Mga unfairness sa batas. 
Ya lah, Mr. Chair ni. Mr. Chair, yeah. no, no. In the case of yeah. uh, Justin Minority Brown, leader. dito po sa interpellations dito, klinaro natin. Kasi precisely yun ang dala natin point of view eh. Once you are uh, declared a Filipino, naturalized as a Filipino, you should be treated like a Filipino. Yun ang sabi na, nag-warning pa nga tayo rito na if he's not treated like a Filipino, baka yung mga anti-discrimination laws meron pang na nababiolate doon. Yeah, I think we, we made that very clear here. But in, of course, it, it really now depends on the uh, aggrieved uh, or the affected person if he wants to assert his rights. So, so pero yan po ang ating interpretation po dito sa dito po sa Senado when we when we granted the the citizenship. Uh, and Mr. Chen, I even ask him pag magkagira tayo sa China, are you willing to fight with the uh, Philippine army? Are you willing to fight uh, under the Philippine flag? Umuo siya. 'Di ba? So unfair naman magpagbarilan siya sa mga kalaban ng uh, kalaban ng estado tapos hindi natin siya papalaruin as a Filipino doon sa PBA you know that's beside the point Mr. Bra Mr. Chairman thank you thank you for the uh, analogy the point. Uh, thank you Mr. Senator Chairman. De Rosa and uh, Senator Pimentel uh, tama uh, bad ni na lang natin ibu uh, but first may siguro may we can ask them to explain the policy and uh, how it can be improved uh, or made more favorable to the state and the people attorney strada yes. Uh, thank you po, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Just very quickly lang po on that point raised by Senator De La Rosa and, and Chairman Popoy. I just want to update on behalf of the EDCOM that uh, that was raised, yung uh, pung, uh, RA 9225, on the restriction on those uh, appointed officials uh, the, of uh, holding dual citizenship. They have to renounce their uh, their foreign uh, oath to, to another country and they should take oath and allegiance to, to the Philippines. That is a general provision to apply to all government employees. Yes, sir. So maybe we should make an exemption, exemption. for uh, scientific research and, uh, and state universities. That, that, kind of, uh, that kind of thing, diba? And then mm -hmm. for all positions, diba? Because yeah. okay. you, you might be depriving the Filipino of a... Of a a fake job. But a Filipino na siya, actually. No? Yeah, so, so, yeah, you have to think of it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I shouldn't say that. Uh, but but it applies. It's a government prohibition that hindi nila naisip na uh, madedehado tayo in, in respect to science and technology. Tama ho ba? Yeah, yes, uh, yes oh. Mr. Chair. In fact, yung pong, uh, faculty of state universities and colleges covered by that restriction and also appointed officials to state universities and colleges. So we're thinking of removing that. We will be presenting that in our next commission meeting. Um, now I'd like to I'd like to proceed lang Mr. Chair on my comments. It's following your following your direction in the last um, hearing that if we want to internationalize and liberalize education, we do not stop in increasing the foreign equity investment. There's a menu of reforms that need uh, to be done and uh, we don't stop there whether it's uh, increasing wealth, whether it's uh, uh, making our education institutions more capable or improving quality. Um, we we need to do a lot of things and we don't stop in increasing the foreign equity investment. Now on that point, uh, Mr. Chair, I just would like to clarify that um, in, um, in allowing or liberalizing uh, education institutions in the country, there are two important aspects. Uh, number one is the establishment itself which concerns the ownership, uh, the incorporation of the entity here, establishing a juridical personality here. And the second aspect is the recognition of that school. Yung pong second aspect, dito po yung, uh, dito do po yung uh, regulatory uh, environment, applying uh, recognition from the Commission on Higher Education. Um, lahat po ng restrictions and na eh. So yung uh, increasing the foreign uh, equity investment or participation, it only concerns yung establishment. That's why we're saying yung pong lahat po ng... Uh, Iniisip natin whether it's a restriction or liberalizing, dun po mangyayari dun sa second aspect which is uh, the regulatory framework. And uh, in EDCOM, we have identified some of the administrative or regulatory barriers to liberalization that should also be addressed if we want to liberalize. So it's not only increasing the, the foreign equity participation, but actually making the policy environment more friendly. As uh, discussed uh, earlier, like yung pong hiring ng faculty. No? I just wanted to share that for, even as it is now, if we want to invite foreign faculty, it has to pass through many uh, regulations, not only from CHED, it has to go through PRC, not only immigration. Like for example, kung allowed na po siya ng uh, CHED, no? based on the program, but the foreign faculty need to get clearance from the PRC because uh, that uh, faculty should come from a country where there is reciprocity, for example. So kung inalaw na po doon at pinagbawal ng PRC, 
hindi rin po yan payapapayagan ng immigration. No? Also for students. So lahat po yun. Um, we checklist be, so we can ano, yes, give us yes, a checklist. Kasi, but it's beyond really the jurisdiction of this committee. Yes. So I appreciate your mentioning it because there are four senators yes. here. Pero maybe we can breeze through that and then yes, focus on the constitutional amendment. Oh. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So yeah, we, we submitted po a, pre a presentation last time. So uh, we'll just uh, we'll, we will answer questions alam po, based on the presentation. Thank yes, you. So, okay. Yeah, because I think that's another that's for another forum, and uh, definitely we want to act on that. And uh, si Chairman uh, Win, si Minority Leader, who's also a part of uh, EDCOM. So thank you. Can we hear from Government Academy Industry Network Gain Executive Director Dr. Uh, Genevieve Ledesma Laurel, and then after that we'll hear from IRI, uh, DTI Tiesa. P.I., uh, Dr. Albert, P.I.D.S. Maybe after Dr. Laurel, Dr. Albert can uh, can speak also. So, Dr. Laurel, you have the floor, ma'am. Yeah. Good morning, Honorable Chairman and members of the Senate and um, distinguished guests and my fellow resource persons today. I'm representing uh, Dr. Peter Laurel, uh, Chairman of uh, LPU, uh, Lyceum of the Philippines University, Chairman of Government Academe Industry Network, and also Chairman of the Association of Universities and uh, Colleges in the Pacific. Um, I'd like to, I, I hope that there will be spousal uh, transfer of knowledge uh, during this, this session. Um, I would like to uh, acknowledge our uh, Senator Gachalian. We've had sessions with you um, recommending our advocacy for national targets for English, science, and math, just like the other Asian countries. And it's very easy to check if they are uh, within global standards because it has been set by the government. I also would like to acknowledge uh, Senator Pimentel, who has been our guest in several uh, 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 the events of the school and likewise um, Senator De La Rosa we have a kinship we come from the same region and uh, Senator Angara we've had sessions with you on how to improve our PISA scores uh, using free resources in the net so thank you very much but I'm here today to express my position of keeping the current constitution intact emphasizing the importance of local control overall educational institutions while maintaining global connections without altering the constitution. Let me just uh, share with you that I am coming from uh, Southfield Global Education Network likewise, a, a network of uh, eight private schools and I have been approached many times by foreign investors to buy in and get control of the school. Uh, uh, they have uh, floated actually price earning of six uh, PE six up to PE eight, and sometimes when you are uh, when you are given a figure of a billion, you think twice. You think twice, but in all of those offers, I knew that there were perils if ever I sign up and make a foreign uh, foreign group own a particular school. I, part, I look at the curriculum, our group, that the experience of many of these foreign investors is when they make money, they sell it again, and then you have new investors coming in. Um, there is one person right now, uh, today, who is here, and he has told me about the horrendous experiences of foreign investors just looking at it as a business. And when they make their money and sometimes they leave the institution with millions of debts, hundreds of millions of debts, and they make the institution right now pay for it and they exit. Um, I, um, there is this one person who used to work for this group who is here right now, living tomorrow, and he will tell you the horrendous experiences of this aggressive foreign bodies that want to buy education. Who is that institution. one person? Um, if we could uh, end the mystery. Yeah. Uh, he is a, a, a foreigner, but I cannot, I can tell you in private. Uh, okay. Yeah, because, <laughs> right. because it was, he told me in confidence what they do and how they damage the schools after leaving and uh, getting I'm just curious why would they damage it if their goal is to sell it then it's no longer sellable or it's yeah, no longer they sell it after, after they sell it, it. Yes. ah okay that's they a different story yeah. 
hundreds of millions of loans right right and then they exit okay yeah and actually without us knowing there are already uh transactions like this going on it's just not under the radar as of now but my experience has been and it's a personal experience i've talked to many and they have layered the ownership and one of them who left this group told me that it, the money comes from the middle east yeah uh, so just just a personal sharing of an experience that i have but anyway i'm here to, uh, today to highlight the current successes in internationalizing education and we are advocating for international education and show how filipinos can access global opportunities without jeopardizing local control i think our issue right now is not really whether we welcome foreign uh, foreign universities and colleges our issue is ownership and that's what i'm saying there's a peril to this aggressive uh foreign investors that will leave you dry after they exit and they sell and uh, there are many financial transactions that happen and uh, i'm happy that i did not sell my soul yeah looking looking back especially having talked to this person yesterday who was a peddler of these aggressive organizations but let me tell you that even those that are prestigious schools in the end prestigious universities abroad in the end it's still they ask you is it worth our time and our effort and let me tell you because uh, right now uh, actually internationalization is here uh, there are no barriers obtaining foreign education credentials at this point uh, the, the tne of uh, ched facilitates transnational education partnerships allowing foreign schools to offer specific programs in collaboration with existing filipino institutions without compromising ownership and control over the core educational principles and convictions let me tell you three three ways we're in we have allowed international universities to coexist with institutions in the Philippines now. The first one is what you call twinning programs. I wish we had the, uh, we had the slides because I don't want to go through all of the schools with twinning programs. AAM, for example, offers a global MBA program with dual credentials where students can earn an MBA degree from AIM and also from University of Western Australia. Then you have Thames International. They also have a two plus two with some, some um, universities abroad. You have Mapua, who offers twinning programs with universities in Australia, Canada, and the United States. And we have Southville International School affiliated with foreign universities that offer Pearson and Southern Cross University. And other partners like... Uh, uh, bachelor's degree for other from Macquarie University. Then the second type of collaboration is called partnerships. You have the Lyceum of the Philippines University. Uh, they foster international connections through partnerships with many, many universities worldwide, including student and faculty exchanges, collaborative research, internships short term to a semester academic and cultural programs. Um, partner universities across the world, Asia, Europe, and Canada. Then we have Southville International School affiliated with foreign universities. By the way, SISFU, we call it SISFU, has been in existence for 28 years. And it's the only transnational education that offers basic education up to master's degree program with a partner school abroad, internationally. So you'll be surprised. What is SISFU, sorry? Uh, uh, not, uh, Southville uh, International School South affiliated yeah. with foreign universities. He said it has been in existence for 28 years, and we offer transnational education from basic ed to master's degree programs, but we retain control of the curriculum, and we only allow these partnerships after having gone through what it is that they will teach our students. You have UST likewise, a long history of international uh, linkages and partnerships. You have Silliman University with a lot of uh, network and academic partnerships across uh, continents. The third, so first is the twinning, wherein they earn a degree from 
two schools, Philippines and another university abroad. The second is the partnership. It's more loose. It's student exchange. It's research collaboration. It is uh, training of faculty, so forth and so on. Uh, student, uh, student experiences, student camping. The third one is the more difficult one to do, which Southville is doing. It is franchising. We are franchising. Uh, we have franchised with actually two providers. Pearson, UK, and De Montfort University of UK. Um, franchising, actually, I was just given the definition of franchising by our president and chairman of SFU. Um, it is uh, a foreign academic partners agree with the host university in the Philippines to deliver the foreign degree curriculum in the Philippines. The teaching methodology and academic standards are closely monitored by the foreign partners. So let me just tell you more or less how much. And even if they come from a very, they're number one in terms of student experience, the Montfort University, but we have very, very few students. We have only about 200, even if we have been existing for a long time. Let me tell you why. Uh, registration fee is about, uh, 775,000 pesos per year or per semester. And uh, uh, program fee is 10,000 uh, pounds or 560,000. And um, annual fee per student, 750, 53,000. Collaboration review is 20,000 and uh, 20,000 pounds. And every year they come to audit, because remember, the grades come from them, the content of the curriculum comes from them, and the final, uh, they have a, they call it a Senate in, in UK. It goes through several, several bodies before the grade is given. So we can do an internal grading here, but it is not final. It's only when, when it comes back and they get the degree from De Montfort. They can even graduate physically from De Montfort University. But it's very, the real universities which have good intentions are expensive. And uh, how does it, how does this franchising help? Instead of our students going abroad, they pay here. And so therefore, uh, it helps in the economics of the country. So, so these are the three ways that are being practiced right now. And, and we have this model for the last 28 years, and it's working. However, because uh, these students are bright, first of all, because UK, UK programs are very, very extensive in terms of critical thinking, but they have the money likewise. There are scholarships going on, but they are, they are limited. So. Uh, let me talk to you about the MOOCs or the MOOCs. These are massive open line courses. These are offered by Harvard, by Coursera, by Yale, and these are available, available to every Filipino. You can even put them on the line and have 500 students listen to a Harvard lecturer without having to without having to spend anything, their fees, so forth and so on. Bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degree programs can also be obtained by any Filipino. Uh, I have a list. I have a list of those uh, uh, popular universities that are offering this. And uh, in the end, I would say that the, the focus the focus should be from my experience, the balancing of international education with our national identity. Controlling school ownership helps regulate curriculum content, uh, ensuring it aligns with our national values and democratic principles. I'd like to say that the thing that made me really not accept these proposals is the, is the threat of losing our freedoms and our democracy because the ideologies are not consistent with ours and it's every semester and there is no way we can monitor what's going on in the classroom eight hours a day allowing foreign ownership may pose a risk of, introdu of introducing 
ideologies inconsistent with our ethos, potentially impacting our commitment to our democratic ideals and freedoms secured by our heroes and our constitution. While the Philippines seeks to engage in international educational collaborations to enhance its educational system, and uh, I think Dr. Calabo uh, late, earlier was saying innovation, it's unique, ge our unique geopolitical situation necessitates a delicate balancing act. Full foreign ownership of schools raises concerns about the potential erosion of our national identity and cultural heritage. Filipinos must maintain authority to shape educational curricula that reflect our values and traditions. It is essential to safeguard what makes us Filipino and ensure that our educational system reflects our core values of governance anchored on our freedoms. In conclusion, in the intricate tapestry of global education, the Philippines' distinct geopolitical position necessitates a strategic approach, one that harmonizes international collaboration with the preservation of our unique identity and democratic values. These approaches, guided by a commitment to national autonomy, empower Filipinos to embrace global educational experiences without relinquishing control over our educational institutions. As we tread this path, it becomes evident that constitutional amendments are not requisite for safeguarding our democracy, Filipino values, national identity, and cultural heritage. Let our educational landscape be a testament to the harmonious coexistence of global connections and national authenticity. By upholding the current constitution and embracing international collaborations within a controlled framework, we illuminate a path towards a future where the Philippines thrives on the global stage while remaining steadfast in its commitment to democratic ideals, Filipino values, national pride, and cultural wealth and heritage. Um, as a representative of GAIN, Government Academy Industry Network, our advocacy is to develop our Filipino talent so that they can be globally competitive. However, these technology skills and other competency requirements are accessible to the Filipino without full Filipino ownership, without relinquishing full control of two non-Filipinos. We have millions of overseas Filipino workers who are grappling with national identity. Let us safeguard and let us ensure that our democratic ideals and cultural heritage are preserved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just noticed uh, we're going on two hours. So maybe if we could take a five to 10 minute health break uh, with the permission of my colleagues and we can resume at uh, 12.05, if that's all right. Uh, that's 12.05, uh, 12.07, around that time. Thank you. Uh, hearing is suspended. <laughs>